All right, we are live. Hey everybody, Custom Mike's here. We are at Bio Customs, or Customs, I should say, uh, to pronounce it right, <laughs> with uh, Max Fish. How you doing? Tim, the crew manager. Oop, let me get out of the light there. Devin, and I didn't get your name. Derek. Derek, nice to meet you. And we actually got Pintard Chris standing in the background there. And we're going to show some of his stuff uh, uh, when we're done with the walkthrough here. And actually, this will be the last one, you know, for, so we're just giving you a little bit of tease. We're just kind of walk through uh, their shop and talk a little bit about the work that they've done in the past and what they're planning on doing in the future. That's good. So why don't you tell us a little bit about where you started? And uh well, I start, it started in 1997, actually. Yeah. Um, I had just a shop in a complex because I lived in an apartment, so I rented a shop so I could work on my Volkswagens with some friends, and the friends kind of stepped out, and they didn't, couldn't afford it anymore, moved, whatever the thing was, and so I was left with the shop by myself, but in a big industrial complex. And so I, uh, um, a friend of mine came by my house to buy a part for a Volkswagen, and I convinced him to split the... Uh, split the building with me and we started doing work for friends and then finally just got to a point where we said you know what let's let's start our own business and so we did so we started bio customs and a few years later he went through a divorce and as a lot of people do when they go through divorces needed a big life change and uh, so it's been solely mine for you know about 20 years at this point uh, so that's uh that's how we got started and I just kept working towards uh, trying to cultivate my own style, trying to figure out the right way to do things, talk to the professionals, uh, race car builders and, and uh, people who have actual information that's real rather than a bunch of opinions. And, uh, and so here I am at this point. Um, and uh, oddly enough, I got into a stage where yeah, after 20 years of doing this full time, it starts to get a, a little tiring maybe you know, start, start feeling the abuse from the wrists and stuff. So I decided that maybe writing a book and educating other people and helping the consult and stuff um, on other people's projects might be a good way to go. So I've kind of started shifting my personal efforts towards, um, towards furthering education uh, for other people and helping other people do their stuff. And then, you know, cultivating a uh, working environment here that can kind of take care of itself where we can continue doing exactly what we've been doing but have the right crew of guys that are you know taking yeah. my style and my my personal approach to things and, and kind of working with it yeah. from there so <clears throat> very cool actually jenny says hi max hi. <laughs> and, and we got a few quite a few people we've got 80 people on board already nice. so uh we are actually out in west westminster winchester or winchester <laughs> there we <laughs> go different. yeah winchester <laughs> And to yeah, give you a little bit of background, I've, I've known about Max for probably since about 2003. Oh, wow. Okay. That's when we moved to Norco. Okay. And at the same time, I also bought 12 acres down in Sage. Okay. Which is? Yeah. A little bit further out. Yeah, and but... I actually drove by and I stopped uh, right out. Actually, we're behind it. Right out there. You can't see it here, but it's, uh, it's a little fruit stand thing. Okay. And I've stopped there probably a... Uh, 200 times and I didn't know you were here yeah. <laughs> and I'm driving up today I'm like oh my god I've been driving up and down the 79 so many times skimming right past <laughs> and drove right past and didn't take an opportunity to come in and see you were probably building this thing back then or during uh, that time yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That's, that's obviously a long-term project on that one yeah uh, and we, we, I promise we'll get back to this one <laughs> uh, that's what they'll be the teaser for the end so you hang around that's with us you know? <laughs> right there. yeah that's the one we can spend a lot of time talking about yeah but, uh, uh, you know, so, and I, I really, I, you know, I have a lot of respect for you for, it takes, takes a lot to, to, uh, to learn a craft to the point that you have, Thank you. where you understand it fully. I mean, I told Max earlier that, that one of the things I did, which taught me a lot of respect for, for suspension, so that I'm 18 years old and I wanted to upgrade the suspension of my old Volvo. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and I tore it all apart and started making stuff and then, you know, and, in the end, to be totally honest, I ended up in the junkyard, but, yeah. you know. I've had a couple of those as well, so Yeah, be fair. <clears throat> and I mean, I've done airbag suspension and stuff, and, you know, after reading the book, and I got a, I got a, I bought a book from you on the pre-order, nice, which you nice. signed, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, 
but uh, reading that book, I'm like, oh my God, what am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it is, you know, I love that part of the book. And, you know, there's probably, I can probably read that thing a hundred times and learn something every time I read it. So that, that's an important part. And, and understanding that you don't understand is the most important part. And being willing to then step up. And a bit, the book's not that expensive for the amount of information that's in there. And there's nothing worse than driving a car after you spent thousands of hours yeah. building it and it doesn't drive very good. Yeah. And I, you know, I've driven plenty of hot rods with Mustang 2s and all the other happy stuff that, oh, yeah. that are yeah. built using what is available for most people most of the time. And it's, a, it's, it's an adequate solution yeah. to upgrade a crappy suspension from the 30s or 40s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, it's not like driving a light model car with all the, the signs in the right place. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's one of the oddities um, that is about anything that's custom is if you don't have, and I talk about it, I think, a little bit in the book, is if you don't have uh, something to compare it to, I think yeah. I put the on and off switch on the shocks, like turn your shocks on and turn your shocks off. And then all of a sudden you go, oh, geez, why didn't I have shocks this entire time? If you don't, you just deal with it. I think people drive lowered cars and just assume that bagged lowered cars just ride like yeah, crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's just what they are. So, uh, and then I say that that's a bunch of BS. Yeah. A lowered vehicle, done right, can drive amazing. Yeah. So, uh, uh, one of my favorite stories is we did a really high-end build for a client where he dropped the keys off to his truck and said it was a uh, first generation Tundra. And he said, just make it ride nice. I want it to be amazing. And he threw down a big old bucket of cash and said, whatever it takes, make this amazing. Somebody yeah. hit him up at a show and says, so what's so special about Max's you know, builds? And he, go, he hands the keys and he goes, go drive it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't pop the hood and show him how cool the work was. Yeah. It was about how it drove. Yeah. And everybody that's ridden in it goes, oh my God, this is amazing. So that's, it's such a hard, how, how do you, if you don't know, yeah. like what's so fancy about a Ducati motorcycle versus a Honda motorcycle? Yeah, yeah, until yeah. you ride both of them, yeah. you can't possibly yeah, yeah, have any yeah. idea. When I bought my MV Agusta, I literally came home and gave my keys to my, my, um, uh, my Yamaha uh -huh. to Tim and said, I will never ride this bike again. <laughs> it's an Italian designer bike yeah. compared to a Japanese bike. Yep, How do yep, you, yep. Uh, yeah, I'm bougie, whatever, but the, that's the comparison. Like yep. you just, until you can do the two next to each other, that can't happen. And I'm serious. I yeah. literally came home from the dealership and handed my keys to Tim. So you actually ended up developing spindles and that type of stuff out of that job, so to say, or? Well, this one's a different- uh, It's a, a different, different one, point, but, but yeah. The yeah, idea is- it's so one of the things we do is um, if you come to us and say, hey, design me a suspension, then we don't just take an existing spindle and work with it because yeah. the relationship between the, the road and the steering wheel starts at the tire to spindle relationship. If those two aren't right, the rest of it doesn't matter how beautiful the rest of it is. This is where the problems start. So we'll design a spindle based around your wheel tire package with all the correct geometry and then everything from there in until it gets to your hand is all designed to do exactly one specific thing. And, and whatever that thing is, is a conversation between me and my clients. Yeah. So um, it's really uh, an oddball thing to try and explain that this is what we do. And people are like, what do you do? We bagged cars, but in a it's, much, much more finite boutique way. So, so in, a, in a way, you are personalizing the suspension for the individual customer's needs. Very much so. Yeah. yeah. I, use, uh, I use boutique uh, to describe the type of work that we do. Yeah. Because uh, I don't think custom, everybody does custom work, of course, yeah. right? Uh, boutique work is very specific. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's tailored to the individual rather than, yeah, it's custom work. This all could be custom work, but we're, when I use boutique, I mean, it's tailored to the client or yeah. what the end result of the vehicle is supposed to be. Another example is the back of this one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, so the client here said, uh, you know, brought us a rear end that uh, is a, I believe this one's strange. This okay. one's strange. This is a strange rear end, so it has a particular look of the housing. So we try and shape all the parts to look similar to that. But, you know, this is, this car is meant to have 800 plus horsepower. And he wants to put the power to the ground mm -hmm. and lay rocker. Yeah. So, you know, we had to develop a special suspension for that. We haven't done the shocks yet, but they'll end up being on a bell crank in order to get them to do what we need them to. Yeah. But, uh, 
that's yeah that's kind <laughs> well, of a, didn't you have a post about bell cranks recently i did yeah yeah <laughs> the, you know the bell crank shocks looked really cool but everybody was so upset about the bag mounting plates yeah i know unnecessarily people's eyeballs get in the way of technical information yeah. sometimes how about if we look at those bell cranks over there because some people don't know what a bell crank is uh yeah, yeah, yeah just yeah, give yeah. it a, you know yeah. three minute what a, a bell crank does and why bell cranks. <laughs> i know you could probably talk for three days about bell cranks but yeah well i mean it, it's a type of cantilever um so a lot of people like to call this a cantilever suspension and and if you put the bag in the middle of the link that's a cantilever suspension so i i like to let's define it as a bell crank so uh the term bell crank came from the little uh the bells that would be at a uh, at a hotel or something like that you'd come in you'd smack the bell it's got a little lever that when you push down the force changes to the side and goes ding that's a bell crank so that's what's happening here it's changing the direction of load so the bag in this in this situation will actually go here and push up on this plate yeah. which will then push down on the axle and yeah. generating lift so uh these are for um, a client who wanted to do something really fun and unique but didn't know how to approach it so he asked us to develop him a suspension build all the parts and then just ship it to him because he's back east he couldn't yeah, bring the yeah. truck here so that's what we did with these but um but that's the basic concept is it's still the distance between here and here is that they're there and so once you put your bag here that's what we're used to seeing is a bag in the middle of the bar and that's what this is doing is just giving us that exact same motion ratio but able to move the bag into a different spot this one's for looks and for fun yeah um some situations it's necessary yeah I mean, you know to get it out of the way yeah for especially with the shock yeah the example. shock uh, trying to fit a shock that has the right amount of travel into the package that we have on that car would require us to actually end up way up into the trunk yeah especially and, when he wants such a distance to go yeah uh, yeah to go. laying body on 24s I yeah think, or 22s 22 yeah 22s custom made for this down the road yeah um, so laying body on uh, 22 means that we need a lot of lift to get that wheel out of that fender well so yeah. it's actually serviceable so, so putting the the shock up and out of the way and using a bell crank for yeah to get changing it. the geometry to the right exactly configuration yeah, yeah yeah well obviously we have to take in consideration the valve uh, valve rate inside of the shock which is yeah. why we use a lot of bilstein stuff because that gives us the option to actually pull shocks apart revalve them internally and put them together so in the same length shock we can you know the volo over there is a good example of that. It's the exact same bodied shock front and rear but the uh the front shocks are stiffer than the rear shocks because obviously the front weighs more than the rear uh, we get the same amount of travel out of front and rear, but now we can order valving to do exactly what we want it to. Uh, and that's the same way that that Tundra I was talking about earlier ended up yeah. with the high-end shock. So, uh, honestly, I, I mentioned it in the book, though, ride quality, tw I would say 80% of ride quality and performance comes from dampers. If you're not using a good quality shock, you've got no hope of actually doing anything yeah, useful. Yeah. So what's the deal with this thing? Uh, so this is a... A uh, client who's just absolutely in love with his Volvo, and he wanted to bag one for a long time, and uh, came up on a chunk of money and decided this is the time we're going to do it. And none of us realized how involved this was going to be. <laughs> yeah, there's I a bet. reason that there's probably this is the only one in the world. I think there's one in Australia, but they'd put a, a truck chassis underneath it. Uh huh. Yeah. So this is all-wheel drive, maintains ABS, maintains all-wheel drive system, none of the check engine lights or chassis or any Volvo. Things will be pissed off under the hood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maintained. Um, yeah, this thing is on the ground. I, I think, I mean, I'm a Volvo guy. I'm from Sweden. I build Volvos, <laughs> but <laughs> this yeah. thing is a killer. Look at that. Uh, the, uh, the only thing that's missing still are shocks. We know where they're going to go. But, uh, yeah, it was a really tough one to squeeze all this in here because these are a turning strut car. Yeah. There's plain old no room for... Uh, wow for whatever we you know trying to do in here so relocating everything we actually raised the entire subframe was raised two two and a half two and a half inches yeah so the motor that's how far down these motors are when we popped the hood we were pretty stoked to realize we could raise all of this up yeah, yeah otherwise yeah. the transmission would be on the ground at this height yeah so we raised the whole subframe and then in the back we just threw away everything stock and just started from scratch because <laughs> there's no way to do anything uh with the rear stuff we, we kept the diff yeah. We use the factory uh, hub bearing, you know, the cartridge bearings. Yeah. Uh, but as far as uh, like all the serviceable parts on this are still are still Volvo or or spherical joints that you can actually buy. Yeah. But the the uh, the design itself had to be pretty much thrown away because there was just no way to get it there. 
Crazy, crazy. I, 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 I think too, you're developing products out of some of the work that you do too. And Finally, yeah. So it's been many, many years people have been saying, hey, you need to sell it, you know, you need to build a kit, you need to do something. And, and it was just never the right time. Um, and I feel like the industry is, is finally ready for a premium product that's uh, above and beyond what's mostly being presented out there. So this is our first is, uh, prototype parts for our Tacoma kit. These are all just fresh from laser we got the other day, test running them. Um, they're all like this lower arm here that you're looking at at the moment. It's all internally gusseted, which is what all these are uh, tabs and slots and everything. And then it's pocketed on the bottom so we can get a, just a normal bolt in there. There's multiple bag, multiple bag mounting positions to change. Um, ride quality. Again, this is all about tailoring to and, uh, different size bags and different positions and get the ride that you want. Everybody says it rides nice. What does rides nice mean? So this allows you to tailor it to your ride. You want it to be soft like a Cadillac. You want it to be firm like a BMW. So we've got multiple bag mount options, multiple position options, um, a really nice Bilstein shock that we've, uh, we've uh, sourced to do this. Um, a couple so of different. Uh, can I ask a really silly question? Sure, they're not silly. Because you know, one of the things that when you think about people in general and their skill level when it comes to suspension, yeah. most people, including me, are willfully ill-equipped to design a suspension. Okay. And you know, we all think that you know. I mean, if you just think of the Mustang Two and the nine-inch rear end sure. movement, so yeah. to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know. You, you can throw that in everything and have a predictable ride, but it, it's not individually tailored or designed. It's no different than somebody going by in a sweater or a suit. Yeah. They have to be tailored to your body yeah. in order to fit well yeah. and exactly. to do what you want it to do. Exactly. And, you know, it, when you go and have a suit tailored, oh, it yeah. costs more than buying it off the shelf. Yeah, but if you're into, because I'm into high fashion, Okay. So I don't, uh, I don't own a suit. So, so here's the thing. Uh, they'll tell you when you start buying suits, the moment you get one tailored is the moment you'll never wear an untailored suit again. True that. you look yourself in the mirror and yeah. you go, man, this looks good. And yeah. then you put on your untailored suit and you'll go, nope. And then you'll take them all up to the tailor. You'll yeah. have them all dialed in because now you know. All yeah. it takes is once. Yeah. And that's really what it's about is you drive in one really nice vehicle that's bagged and does exactly what you want. Now you're ruined. Yeah. So, yeah, it's like I was talking about with the MV, my motorcycle. It's just once you've done it, it's, you know, he's, he loves his Yamaha, but <laughs> <laughs> not even close. Yeah. 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 yeah, there is a difference. And I mean, even, even you will have a different suit for a different event. Yeah. If you go to the opera, you will have one. If yep. you go out to a different one, you know, and it's no different. You drive a mini truck, it'll be designed differently than an Impala, yeah. which will be designed differently than a Mercury, depending on what you intend to use it for. Yeah. And even if you think about a race car, um, different tracks have different needs. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, a friend of mine, actually, Thorsten, that's here visiting from Sweden, which is my mentor. Okay. His son is doing, Frederick, is doing uh, uh, motocross shocks. Oh. And he's valving and, and yeah. you know, doing all the shims. and all, I, mean, I don't know. You know, it's way beyond what I want to deal with. Yeah. You know, I'll buy a shock and bolt it on. You know, yeah. But, yeah, yeah. but he will custom tailor suspension shocks and stuff mm -hmm. for the motocross, for the different tracks and all that stuff. And, yeah. and depending on what the customer's weight and all that type of stuff. So this right here is the ultimate in that. Uh, yeah. I mean, you took, you took somebody with, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to, was it Tacoma? I think this one is. This a, is a Tacoma kit, yeah. yeah. First generation Tacoma. Yeah. And then you're, you're developing something and you, and it worked really good for that particular niche. Yeah. And, and there's enough of them out there that want a better suspension for that vehicle that, yeah. that it's, it warrants you actually going into a, to a production at some level. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of, uh, so we can, of course, you could bring your truck to us and we could develop something that rides just this good. Yeah. Um, one, you know, one at a time. Yeah. But, uh, the thing is, is if I spend, I've got a couple hundred hours developing this, yeah. um, We'll get to the shock here in a second. <laughs> uh, we've got a couple hundred hours in developing this kit so that when it's done and you bolt it on your truck, it'll literally take one or two days to install. And then you end up what would normally take us a week to do one off. Yeah. You can do that. And now you have the ride quality that you would normally get from us by bringing your truck to us um, and having us do. And then you can just buy it over the counter. Not everybody's going to want to spend the kind of money that this is going to be. It's, yeah. not, it's not super expensive. It's... Let's just throw out a number and say it's roughly a thousand dollars more than the other kits that are out there. Yeah. But that's like a BMW 
3 Series versus a Honda Accord. Yeah. You know, it's not terribly more expensive, but which one rides nicer? Yeah. I mean, there's just, it's just it. So, um, so that's kind of what we're doing with this. Yeah. And, and tailoring it, you know, to get back to your question. Yes, it's important. I saw, you know, a post uh, the other day on one of the accounts where somebody's asking for information about bags. And one person's response was, I've been doing this forever. Just run the biggest bag you can and it'll give you the best ride. That is such an arbitrary, generic approach. Yeah. Like, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, you know, hey, I'm hungry. Well, just go get whatever food you can and eat it. You're fine. <laughs> uh, that's just the silliest thing ever. And why people approach suspensions like that is, is beyond me. Yeah. But uh, So I can stop holding this shock. <laughs> <laughs> um, so these are the, the higher end shocks that I was talking about where they're rebuildable. So um, this normally would go to a reservoir yeah. separately. It doesn't need to. The reservoir is more for the higher performance stuff. Um, so we can take uh, the, this is nitrogen charge, so we can take the nitrogen charging out of it, and then there's a special tool that allows us to pull all the valving out of this, and you were talking about the shim stacks. We can go in here and we can change the shim stacks, we can change the viscosity of the oil, and we can get this to do what we want it to independently, the way the shims are set up, is compressing it is softer than rebound, or vice versa, or whatever do we want to do. We could, we could, you know, on the Chad's car, if we had to turn the valving upside down for some weird reason to where when the suspension compresses, it extends the shock, we can literally just take the valve stack and flip it over, and now the shock acts exact opposite of that. It doesn't care internally uh, to an extent. Things yeah. get a little bit weird when you're jumping a truck at 120 miles an hour, but for road use, you yeah, can yeah, turn yeah. the valving upside down and it pretty much doesn't care. Yeah, like the stadium so, trucks got some crazy shocks. <laughs> yeah, things start happening really weird. When you're going through that kind of, uh, the velocities that those are seeing, they're literally cavitating the shocks internally. Yeah. Cavitating is where you create such a vacuum, you actually expand the air bubbles, the little tiny air bubbles that are suspended inside, it expands those. And of course, guess what doesn't dampen well, air. Yeah. So you can't, you know, you can't meter air. So if you're hitting something super, super hard that you're cavitating the shock, now you've just messed up the valving of the shock. So yeah. they, they, they take different approaches to, you know, some of the shocks, they'll actually bring the reservoir off of the bottom to eliminate the uh, cavitation that could happen from that on the shot on the top. It is all kinds of weird yeah. stuff, but you get my point. Yep. Damping, totally damping technology is incredibly expensive. Springs on the other hand, springs are pretty straight up. Yeah. Like a steel spring. There's there's some complexity to it, but not like damping. Well, you can have regular and progressive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I uh, I think I mentioned in the book as well. I have actually my best handling bike is uh, a cheap bike, thirty five hundred dollars, and it handles better than my eighteen thousand dollar MV. Yeah. Because I went to a motorcycle place and had it valved for me. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so. The way that uh, it works is you get on the phone, they'll, they'll take your weight, your age, the type of riding and everything you're gonna do, and they'll tell you exactly what spring you should run because that's easy. But then you're like, hey, what valving should I do? Well, this is where you have to pay us <laughs> because that's where the technology is, yeah. is the valving, not the spring itself. I have Sean Nolmeyer who tell me, tell Max, thanks for building my badass wedding ring. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do jewelry. <laughs> yeah, that's actually where, where we first started talking you were going to make a ring. Yeah, yeah, and, we'll still and do that one of these days. That was six years ago. <laughs> yeah, it was a while ago, huh? Yeah, when I reached out to send you a message, I was like, yeah. man, has it been that long? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, we get caught up. I mean, you, you get a project that, you know, like the Tacoma or even the, the, the Mercury back there. Yeah. It, it, people don't realize how many hours that you devote to a build of that nature. Oh, yeah. It's endless. You know, I mean, I, I, mean, I know... It, if I just take the Mini Merc, which I can relate to, mm -hmm. you know, and that's a that's a pretty crappy build in comparison. It's it's a custom with a K, so mm -hmm. suspension and motor and all that stuff doesn't really matter. It's more about the looks part. Yeah. And I stopped counting at 4,000 hours. Oh, yeah. You can't even... You know, because it got ridiculous. I'm like, I am redid certain things three or four times because I didn't like the way they looked. And I thought I liked the way they yeah. looked the first time. And, you know, or you design something and you end up designing yourself into a corner for some reason. Excellent. Whether you have knowledge or not knowledge yeah. and, and yeah. you know, so you end up making it better or improving it over time. But, you know, most people don't realize that, that a, a build, you know, will take three to five years and you'll spend 50000 to probably half a million dollars, depending on what your target is. Yeah. And, and it, there is really no free ride when it comes to that. You know? Oh, no, no, no. We, uh, 
you know, I see a lot of, of shops complain about getting sponsorship requests and stuff. We just don't get that. Yeah. You know, I've had that one and it was because of the kit. When I posted this kit, somebody yeah. reached out for some reason, people think that kits can always be sponsored, but we don't get people calling us up looking for sponsors because we don't do the kind of work that would yeah. even be yeah. that. But you know, on your point of uh, the amount of time it takes, we never counted the hours on the Merv. Yeah. <laughs> we never wanted to. I asked the client if he wanted to count the hours and he goes, Oh no. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to know. know. No. I well, know. We blew his budget out of the water by four or five times. Yeah. And he just shrugged his shoulders. His wife mm. said she wanted to turn the car over and fill it with water because she wanted a pool for the house and he got the car instead. <laughs> so when she saw it, she's like, whatever, I'd rather just flip it over and fill it with water. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, it happens. Uh, can we take a moment? I want to introduce Tim. Yes, absolutely. Yes, so, well, I'm, I'm spending a lot more time doing the, uh, the educating, the consulting, writing, the product development and stuff. Uh, Tim's been with me for 10, about 10, about 10 years, about wow. 10 years. And, Long time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A handful of years ago, he, uh, he's talking about trying to get in the CHP Academy and I was like, you know, you want to like park here, we can turn this into a career for you. And we started kind of shifting him towards managing because i knew at some point i didn't want to be out here working like i said just it's hard on the, on the body parts so i believe me i know that and, and he's a lot younger so he's and he needs the freedoms because he's got you know several kids and from different situations happening where he needs to be able to take off and i said we can we can groom you to start running running and managing my shop and it's pretty much to a point where tim handles 90 percent of what's handling happening out here in the shop while I'm doing the consulting and product development and stuff. So mm -hmm. Tim, people will start seeing Tim's face a lot more um, out in, in the wild, as it were, when we're going to car shows and stuff. So if yeah. you guys ever see Tim at a show, stop him, walk up, give him a high five, or treat him poorly, whichever Always. way you like. <laughs> <laughs> treat him poorly if that's the way you feel. But, uh, but yeah, so Tim, Tim is, uh, is kind of an oddity because BioCustoms is kind of valueless without Max Fish, right? Because that's all that matters. We don't create a product. So yeah. selling it to somebody is, is uh, well, here are my tools. This yeah. is what you get to buy for bio custom. You do have some nice tools, though. I, yeah, I like the older, the older machines for yeah. sure are pretty solid. But, uh, but it makes it really hard to sell. Like I've spent my, you know, half of my life creating a business that I can't sell. Yep. It's a terrible, it's a non-sustainable model. It means I have to work until I die. Yeah. But Tim, on the other hand, uh, ended up shaping into exactly the kind of person that I hoped would be able to take this over. And, uh, and so here he is, and I'm super proud of what he's been doing. Uh, so it makes it so much easier for me to yeah. be able to help yeah. other shops. If well, I, I mean, it, it's the combination of the skill sets just makes BioCustom more valuable. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah. And then the development of products, et cetera, that comes out of the work that's being done here. I mean, it's the catalyst. You, you're creating the catalyst to move some of these products around. Yeah. And move them yeah. forward, et cetera. And, and probably help with you, the... You know, what's the next book? Front Suspension and IRS, actually. Front Suspension and IRS. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Because yeah, I got so some questions later on. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't it, everybody? It's going to be an oddball one because rear suspension is pretty easy. I can go make the instant center around the front bumper. That's a pretty easy target. Yeah. Uh, front Suspension does not work like that. There is no target instant center that works. There's no, there's three schools of thought about which is a better target. Uh, so it's going to be a bit of an odd one for me yeah. where the book has the current book has a lot of what I call fluff in it. Um, there's a lot of technical information, but there's a lot of, uh, anecdotal stuff or airbag theory and shock theory and stuff like that helps. Fill yeah. It. I think the front suspension book, the next book is going to be just chock full of technical information. I That's fantastic. We, yeah. It's going to be great, but I don't think we have much of a, uh, an option, but to just plow a ton of info in it. So, uh, yeah, pre-apologize, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good, man. Uh, you also have some really cool stuff out there yeah. to show us. We actually have Piss Type Chris here, too. Yeah. Chris! <laughs> yeah, there, there's... Watch me summon him. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you guys taking the time and letting us to come out and hang out and check yeah, your shop right. out, you know. There's some other cool stuff sitting out here, too. <laughs> Here's a fun one. Let me show you the kind of detail we like to do. If you if you look down the side of this this Merc here, if you catch the line down the side of it, we actually pinched the entire, you can see the rocker. This is the stock position of the rocker. We pushed the entire side of the car in. 
in order to get the big old fat pucker that these mercs have. Ah. Uh, so now we've got a really clean organic line. There's a lot of body work that still needs to be done. Yeah, yeah, But yeah. it doesn't make sense to do any of the body work if the line, if the car is puckered really bad. So we just pushed the entire side of the car in and lined everything up. So now we've got this really cool straight, um, you know. That's quite that. a bit. Yeah, this was one that um, had a lot of really rough work done um, under, or like in, in the A-pillars. So we had yeah. to completely rebuild the A-pillars. Somebody did uh, these Mercs, uh, as you may know, they don't have any real way to adjust the doors. No, so I know. Somebody <laughs> tried to adjust them by just filling the door jam with lead. Oh, geez. So they never were straight. And once we, <laughs> once we, you know, stripped all the lead out of the jam so that we could have a nice solid thing to start with, we realized they were absolutely trash. So we had to build the A pillars from scratch. Wow. But anyways, so off of that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so these are all Pinstripe Chris. This is Pinstripe Chris himself. What's Why don't you up? tell us a little bit about you? My name is Jeff. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> by Pinstripe Chris. And anyways, these are examples of Sharpie marker art cars. Sharpie marker art car. What did you tell us about that? So all the uh, artwork is done freehand with paint markers, which may or may not seem super obvious. So in any of these cars, like we never talk about like a plan or what's going to happen, just freehand it and make it up as you go. And thankfully, Max has been gracious enough to provide me with a few canvases over the years. You know, when I look at it, I, it to me, it looks like it's done with a brush. That's kind of the idea. Yeah. Especially uh, the metallic colors because they have a little bit of streakiness to them. Yeah. They try to move quick with the markers so they have a little bit more of a brush feel because if it ends up being, if it looks like a solid color, then it kind of reads a little bit more as a wrap. And this kind of uh, sorts out some of the questions early on. It looks more genuine if it's got some brush stroke to it. True. Uh, well, it's sort of incidental. It's not like I'm forcing it to do it. The material naturally wants to do that, but I think the look looks more genuine. Very nice. Yeah, they different styles. What about this one? Sure. Same thing, a uh, paint marker. But yeah, different style. Each of the each of the cars we try to approach a different way. And we can kind of talk about like what the uh, what the goal of the end result is be, but it's silly to just take one idea and keep reproducing it. But this one was a unique opportunity to really do something different using the same tools. Um, but yeah, this one definitely stands out amongst the group of art cars, that's for sure. Yeah, no, I, I love that it centers out of that wheel and just explodes on the car. That was a cool idea. We talked about a few different ways to do the car, and arriving at that was really, really clever for the car. Yeah. And it really changes the dynamic of the, of the car as a whole. Especially since the other side had, like, nothing. Oh, I didn't even see that. So I didn't catch that. It's actually, like, a clean-looking car. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, quite a contrast. And then we got this baby. Why don't you tell us a little bit about this one? Tim, you get to tell you Tim, about you one. get to be on camera. It's one of Tim's big projects that he managed. It is. In the so this yeah. one's a 54 Bel Air for uh, the same owner of the 62 Impala that's in the shop. Okay. This originally came to us as just a quick, it was bagged by a previous shop. He just wanted to go through it, make it kind of a solid driver. And just the deeper we got into it, the worse the parts came, all the suspension on it pretty much had to be thrown away. And just as, as it progressed, we got crazier and crazier with the build. It's a keeper for him. It's never going to be sold. Yeah. We started with, I think the donor car was a 79 Camaro. We were just going to pull the rear end and motor out of it. That was the original plan for yeah. it. And uh, again, got wild from that. That wasn't enough motor for him. So we ended up building a nice, nice dart motor for it. The, uh, Suspension, same thing. Ended up going a little crazier on it because of the amount of power that he wants to hold. Yep, yep, yep. You got to be able to put it yeah. down without breaking stuff, right? Absolutely. And this one's pretty cool because all the underpinnings of the car, obviously, it, it's it, it's kind of faded. The patina that's on it, it doesn't look like a ton as it sits. But this vehicle, for me, if you get it up on a lift, there's a ton of detail work underneath. The suspension is extremely clean. It's a great driving vehicle. And we got some more of Pinstripe Chris art Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the cool thing about this thing is that it, you know, I love actually the patina factor. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm That's so tired nice. of paint it's very cool. and cleaning yeah. it and all that stuff. <laughs> I love the lights too. Are they Lee lenses or? Uh, These ones, I'm not sure actually. They, yeah. yeah, they came with the car. So yeah. yeah. So it'll probably end up with custom ones because that's, that's one of the things we have is the... Uh, we're working with uh, one of my partners who builds custom lenses, so we'll probably end up doing something custom for it. Okay. What? Well, who's he? Uh, Matt Overloop. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, he's uh, he's out, actually out of uh, Florida, but he's part of my, you know, all of my production parts and my consulting is run through a separate company that uh, it's called F2 Development. Uh huh. Um, and it's more of a. Um, you could contact us and say, hey, I'm trying to achieve a particular goal. And yeah. we have a team of people who can achieve that goal. Very cool. we don't have to worry about whether they're pretending to know their job or not. Um, so the, uh, so Matt's one of those guys. He can do 3D print custom taillights. And um, he's, he's actually the one that 3D models all of my parts. I give him the 2D designs. And then he turns them into a 3D model. Make sure that there's no interface problems and just turns it into an actual like digitally tangible part i guess yeah. before we you know before we run and have the laser parts so you know first run a laser can actually work rather than hoping that it works yeah yeah uh, but that's yeah, awesome yeah matt's kind of a, a, a integral part of this state this phase of my my career as it were so yeah again this is this is probably has to be my Second next to the Mercury, one of my favorite engine bays that we've done here. <laughs> Again, there's a ton of detail that's that's under the hood of it. Um, he wanted the more modern fuel injection, so we went with the the eight stack like that to make it look more of an early. You don't want a big big throttle body or anything on it. So when it came to us, the full throttle body was a full polished. And again, with the detail thing, it was a hey, we need to strip this entire thing down. I want all the individual parts painted on it which gives it a great, great feel. He, he wants it to look early without screaming, hey, I have big aftermarket parts on me, which was a big thing for us yeah. to, help to go through and do that for him. Um, I love the contrast between the outside and the inside. The, you know, we can't see the underside today, but no, maybe yeah. uh, in the future Absolutely. we can come back and yes. see that part of it. Yeah, you know? and the, the entire underside of the car <clears throat> is built to that quality. All the suspension, everything's powdered. It's, yeah. it's very clean underneath. I'll, I'll go around you. Yeah. Get a different angle. It's just beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> I can't even imagine going down the road with this and opening that up. The oh, roar, it's, just it's, roar. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's an amazing <laughs> sounding car for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it goes back to those days when you flip the lid on your four barrel. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> no, right? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. think you have something like this. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Huh? It's kind of the same contrast on the Mustang too, versus uh, <laughs> yeah. oh, that, oh, <laughs> especially yeah. designed. Yeah, and yeah. This, it is great because of how the car looks on the outside when if you're out in a parking lot and you fire this up, everybody always comes running, oh, what's, what's underneath that thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> Very cool. And then, you know, Pierce, I'm Chris Hart. I like this design is completely different than the other two, too. Yeah, they're always going to be a little bit different. Kind of look at the style of the car and look at the area that it's going to be and try to fill it a little bit differently. Yeah, no, I, lo I love that. This is probably my favorite, nice. you know. Uh, but I, I can't wait to see where this car is going to go eventually. Oh, I even missed this one. Look at this. <laughs> nice little sneaky one right there, huh? Well, as Tim said, the, the car is kind of about the details. The overall yeah. feel has these little, little things about it that really make it stand out. From yeah. The stuff that's underneath the things that are underneath the hood. So. Yeah, this is going to be a great car. Yeah, and there's still so much work that they're going to do to it still, yeah. Yeah. Well, the projects, they, they have faces. I mean, when I built, you know, like we were talking about the Minimark, that was three major faces yeah. over five years. Yeah. And it only was, it was only down for one week when I was chopping the top. Oh, wow. Before I got the front windshield. Yeah. But I drove it from, from Burlingame to Berkeley mm -hmm. with, uh, without a windshield oh, wow. <laughs> for wow. one week. I just had a motorcycle <laughs> goggles on it because it was my commute car. Yeah. You know, people thought I was crazy, but, well, you know. You were. Well, yeah, <laughs> but I, you know, it's a, the way I, if a car dies during the process, it takes way too long for oh, me. Oh, yeah. It's, it's got to run. run. Yeah, that, that's why we're doing this in this stage. The, the 62 that he's building is just a high-end car, yeah. period. You can't, you can't do big, Whoops. big, you can't do high-end builds in bites like that, not ultra high-end builds in bites like that, but you can do a car like this in bites where we'll give it to him, he'll drive it for six months, bring it back, we'll do a bunch of body work, we'll give it back to him and do that. Yeah. To do something like that to the Merc makes absolutely no sense. Yeah, end up having to undo and redo yeah. so much weird stuff, it doesn't make it so, or it doesn't make sense to do that. So it just depends on the the, uh, the type of build and yeah. what the end product is supposed to be. We talk to the client about, let's do this in stages, or you're just gonna have to have a whole bunch of money. You know, it depends on how we're doing it. Yep. So let me ask you, Chris, where do they get a hold of you if they wanted a paint job like this or, uh, or art like this? Let me sure, rephrase. Sure. Art like this. 
Pinstripe Chris, pinstripechris.com, or on Instagram, Pinstripe Chris, uh, Facebook. Chris. YouTube, it's all Pinstripe Chris. That's fantastic. Just type it in, you'll find me. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Know. Yeah, they, you know. You don't have a bar named after you? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not that cool. I got a, there's a bar in New York that's been around since the 80s that's called Mac Fi, Max Fish Bar. And wow. So I cannot, in the way he can take Pinstripe Chris and actually market that, I can't market Max Fish. It's an absolute waste of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah I've had people <laughs> call, tag me in like, hey, I'm going to be playing at Max Fish this weekend. Like, I don't have you on my schedule, man. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, do you want to talk about the Mercury? Do you want to talk about the Mercury? Oh, I want to talk All about right. the Mercury. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Yeah, now, look at that thing. It's pretty cool, man. You can have it. Just go look up Pinstripe Chris. You can have your own version of that. <laughs> Yeah, let's go back and see the price, possession of the, well, it's not a possession, but a build. Yeah, at this point, we were just, uh, we took the car back from the client. He had it for several years. Yeah. And we brought it back from the client to go through all the little, like, little, little bugs and whatnot to fix all the stuff out uh, so that he can, you know, go back to it and enjoying it again. Um, so we, you know, replaced the windshield and the back glass and just, just little things that kind of start to deteriorate over the years. Because this is a driver for him. Yeah. This is, you know, he's on tour, but when he's home, he wants to drive this. Yeah, which so, I could totally get. I mean, I would want to drive this every day. Yeah, so a lot of the stuff that we did to this car was done because he wanted to drive it. He, he called me one day and he says, what do you think about an IRS? And I said, well, uh, I don't think there's any reason that a custom like this, a sled, doesn't need an IRS. And he goes, well, I want to drive it and I want it to be as comfortable as it can be. And yeah. So he goes, it's whatever it takes to build an IRS. Okay, so we're building an IRS. And this is actually <laughs> fully independent, four-wheel disc brake. Uh, it says, uh, it's like, exotic, I guess, of a chassis, as you would expect underneath. Yeah. Or I guess you wouldn't expect underneath a sled. That's true. Um, but it's kind of got a weird, uh, like, old-school throwback, modern mix anyways. Um, just the way that we built the car style-wise, so the, the IRS isn't that far out of place, but still, it, it's a little odd to, to hear about it, or just to jack yeah. this up and see. Well, I mean, the, the car, yeah, again, it's a, it's a custom tailored yeah. to the yeah. owner and, and his wishes of, of what he wants to accomplish with it. And I think that's an important part that most people uh, uh, lose sight of, is they don't think in about the end product. What I want to use this vehicle for. And I, you know, I, I use this example a lot. I, I, I have a person that I know that bought a brand new CR1 when they came out with a, you know, the glass hood and all that stuff. And yeah. he only drove it for 50 miles or so, took it to a Corvette shop, spent $250,000 on it. $38,000 on the long block alone, right? Yeah. 1,200 horsepower, uh, uh, you know, the, what do you call it, the slip from the motor... Dino? Dino, yeah, yeah. Dino slip. And he takes delivery on it. Where's the first thing he goes to? Car, uh, um, shoot, what's the big uh, good guy show down in San Diego? Um, uh, the good guy show. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, I don't do a, lot of a good guy's fairground show. Yeah. And he gets pissed off because it's loading up all these crews in the fairground with his wife. Oh, yeah. I'm like... If you thing. built this car for driving on the fairgrounds with your wife with the AC on, yeah. why are you putting a 1,200 horsepower yeah. motor in it that's meant for a racetrack? Yeah. The car that you bought, you could put my grandma in it. She could go to the store and buy milk and have the AC on and still handle it with 700 horsepower that most people can't even handle. Yeah. You know, so he took a car, spent two hundred fifty thousand dollars on it, and ruined it. Yeah, turning it into something he didn't want it to be. Yes. Yeah. And so, if you start from the end with what do I want this car to do, and what does it take to do that, you're going to end up with a much different product. That, if, when we get a call from <coughs> any new potential new client, yeah, uh, I well, they you know they message us. It's, this is social media, so we get a message and says, yeah. "Hey, I want to work on the car." But I always say, "Let's get on a phone call." And yeah. I do that for two primary reasons. One, let's make sure we get along. Yeah. If we yeah. can't have a good, meaningful conversation over the phone, yeah. if you're going to drop $100,000 with us and we yeah. don't get along, that makes no sense for either one of us. Very and true. And two, what are we trying to do with the car? Yeah. What is your end goal? Because if we don't have an A to Z goal, 
yep. then we end up going all over the place. It costs a ton of money. It's not fun for us. I don't care if you want to pay us hourly to do yeah. and undo a bunch of weird work because you don't have an end goal. We get we start to lose interest in the build. Yes. Regardless if we're being paid or not. And I so. had a perfect example. I had a client back, this is probably 20 years ago. He brought a different set of tires and rims into this car three times during a one year build. Oh. And this is a chop channel section 32 yeah. that had big meats on it where we had to tub it and all that stuff. And every time we ended up having to redo the body to fit the new tires. Yeah. And it, it became, it, it became literally retarded. Yeah, it's uh, and it costs so much more money than if you had a clear trajectory where you want to go. And I understand there's going to be changes as you come along. Of course, of course. this but is unforeseen stuff. It's a matter of about being productive. Yeah. You know. Well, they did a study uh, years ago, and I don't know where you can find it, but uh, they did a study where they were kind of curious if you paid a human really, really well to do mundane work, how long would you stick around? So they were paying these guys, like, let's just say $40 an hour to show up to work, dig a hole, and then to come in the next day and fill the hole in, essentially. Oh, and 80% of the people quit because the job was unfulfilling. Yes. So if all you're doing is just a bunch of rework, rework, rework. The dollar figure you're being paid... Has it, no meaning. It's, yeah, it becomes meaningless. And it's, it's so hard to, to work around that. We want this to be fun. Yeah. And that's not how you make this fun. So let me ask you, I got a lot of questions about what that color is. And I, I'm, I'm tempted to say envious green. Uh, <laughs> I, we developed this color specifically for this car. The client, uh, the client had a very, very specific look that he wanted, and so this is the most time we've ever spent trying to create a color. Yeah. And it's a special recipe that I'm not giving out. Like that's I what I thought. It, I call it asparagus piss. Oh. But the client likes to call it something a lot more peaceful, and I don't actually remember what that is because it's not fun. <laughs> Yeah, so, I I, I'm going to stick with Envious Green because <laughs> you can't have it. <laughs> my, one of the, the most uh, the best moments of my entire career is we were uh, I was detailing this car out at SEMA on Monday, which okay. is roll-in. That's where everybody that starts to set up. And I'm underneath there polishing the car, and this was inside in one of the main halls. And John Kosmowski, uh -huh. the, uh, the founder of House of Color, yep. which this car is all uh, House of Color paints, um, and they worked with us in the beginning to help develop the color and everything. So Kosmoski came by. He had no idea. And of course, he's he's just the, the poster child for uh, House of Color at this point. It's corporate owned. Yeah. So Kosmoski stops on his way by the car and he goes, oh my God, that is an absolutely gorgeous car. What color is that? And I said, well, we developed the color just for this client. And uh, so he asked a couple questions and he goes, oh, what brand is this? And that's all your guys' product. Yeah. And he goes, what? Is how did you get that color flaw out of it? Because there's blues and oranges and greens and yellows and all kinds of stuff happening. And uh, I said, I, I don't know, man. Maybe you can tell me. And I told him what the recipe was. And he goes, I don't know. He shrugged his shoulders and says, I, I, we're going to have to ask the, uh, the chemists on this one. So uh, I asked him if he would come back by later in the week because the client was going to be here on Wednesday. So he stopped by uh, uh, to, to meet the client. And he said, this is one of his top 10 favorite Mercs of all time. Yeah. I was like, done, we can leave the show. Yeah. That's the best compliment I think I could ever get is have Kosmoski tell me this is one of his favorite Mercs of all time. That's cool. fantastic. Oh, it, yeah. it is a, it's an extraordinary car. Thank you. Yeah. Can we see under? Sure. So this is, uh, this is one of our corner cutting areas was uh, not paying for the flathead. So we took the small block Chevy and we just over detailed it. Yeah. Um, Apparently there's some detail on here still. <laughs> well, we're in the shop to get fixed. So, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not a final detail. So we machined oh, that's the, air, beautiful. the air cleaner, used a Merc hubcap center, which all the wheels on the car actually match as well. But this is all yeah. machined in-house, all manual machines. The intake manifold, we did all of the, uh, the uh, water jacket um, to like match the manifold yep. all the way around. All of the bolts are all punched, so they've got like a recess for the washers. Um, you know, everything is uh, no hose clamps, you know, as hidden as possible. Just a ton of little tiny detail work. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, even this piece right here, how many yeah. hours do you have in that? Uh, you know, um, I mean, uh, that's yeah. not an easy piece to make. I can tell uh, you that right now. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, even these, you know, people go, oh, you just bead rolled them and then broke 
Well, no, they're curved. It's not uh -huh. only curved this way, but it's also curved yep. this way. So, and there's just a little recess in them. There's a, so much little minor detail work. Um, it's insane to try yeah. and explain the little stuff. You know, even just going through the trouble of machining these little these little hood supports or rebuilding the factory hood hinges with a better looking yeah. you know piece and then these little bullet ends instead of bolts or rivets and just little tiny subtle things you know the brake master cylinder uh, reservoir fills in the cowl because the brake master is under the uh, floorboard so in order yeah. to make it to where it's at least somewhat user serviceable those little tiny details are uh, it's endless on this car yeah um, the amount of uh, tension, you know, we shrunk the side of the car down as well, took some of the fat out of it. Yeah. A lot of people ask how much we chopped the roof. We literally didn't chop the roof. We, this car was a disaster when we got it. And actually everything from the windshield frame back, uh -huh. all handmade. The doors, the fenders, and the hood, and the windshield of the frame are the only thing that's still original. And all the rest of this is all made with flat sheet metal. Wow. Mine, uh, the roof skin we started with one off of a 56 chevy wagon i believe is what it was and okay. then just shaped it to do what we wanted but we didn't chop this any amount we made it look the way we wanted it to so we have no idea how much we chopped it we you know thinned out this section we raised the uh, raised the eyebrows of yep the, yep of the windshield well, to get a little bit better proportion i told I'm, yeah. I'm totally with you yeah just clean up the proportions um all of like, these lines on a 50, oh yeah on a 51 this piece stops right about here yep it fades into nothing yeah so the problem with the 51s is these uh, the points Corners. of the back glass yep. end up being tucked in really yep. far um so in order to make this look organic we push when we built all of this we push that body line in yeah so that this is a much cleaner line yeah and so where it would normally just come out to here and die like that that'd be super fat to try and fill that gap so we push that little line in and, and you know crisp up these peaks and made the whole uh, the back of the pontoon line up with the tail lights, which I believe these are 54 tail, 54 yeah. tail lights. And then we but I love, I mean, the attention to detail. But well, this thing dives in there and it disappears at the right point. And it, it, it's dead crisp until it disappears right into the reverse design mm -hmm. line. Mm -hmm. That's, most people don't see that stuff. They don't even look for that. Yeah. But that right there, this is art. This is art right here. Took more than a few days to get Yeah, I know. <laughs> or the, the Mercs, yep. they, this normally overlaps like a yep. Volkswagen bug hood and they just end up with a really dirty line out here. So yep. we decided to just remake this whole thing and put more of a pancake, I guess you would call this. Yeah. Um, and then have this line actually come around the back of the car. Yeah, which really complements everything and gives a completely different look. Yeah, the, uh, the client struggled with some of these because some of the mods we did are avant-garde. And he didn't know what to think. And then when it was all done, he's like, all right. Because even the front and rear bumpers are more like roll pans than yes. they are chins. But um, they really they, complement the vehicle. Yeah, though. thank you. You posted, yeah. if anybody wants to see this car done, uh, Mike had posted a picture of it uh, yep. last night. So uh, you can see what I mean by the roll pans. But the client's like, I don't know, man. And then once he saw the car done, he goes, I hate that you were right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Well, that's the thing, too. Sometimes, or actually say a lot of times, you really need to trust the builder. It, you know, that's part of that conversation you have initially. You need to develop a relationship with the builder and the client to a point where you trust each other and you both understand what direction that you normally go as a default. Yeah. And one of the things I do with the people that come to me is, is I sit down with them. And actually, the first thing I tell them, you need to give me a pro and a con board. Yeah. And I said, you just go through all the internet and print all the pictures that you like and print all the things you hate. Yeah. That's and good give idea. me a pro and a con board. So I can get into your head and understand where you're at and what things you like. Yeah. Because then I can have that as a guide. Yeah. And if I think about something that I'm thinking about designing and it fits with the con board, yeah. then I know that's probably not a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's and really I can, smart. You, yeah. you know, yeah, I like and I have that. many conversations. I usually do, you know, at least eight or 10 lunches with a customer mm -hmm. talking through the pictures that he's bringing as he's building his pro and con board. Yeah to really understand where we need to go. Because I, I hate making, get, get halfway into a project and then the customer gets, you know, there's a thousand reasons why. But if yeah. it goes bad because we didn't prep well enough, then that's not a good thing either for, yeah, no, for no. anybody, you know? Yeah. And I mean, ultimately when you end up with a customer such as this one that keeps bringing it back for the upgrades, the fixes, the, you know, whatever, when he uses it, that's the ultimate compliment to your build quality. Oh you know? yeah, yeah, so. absolutely.
Yeah, that's, that's why I say let's make sure we get along first. Because yeah. that means we can communicate when that time comes. Because I've yeah. had clients that I show them something and then they just get upset with me yeah. because they think I did it out of spite or something weird. And uh, I, how do you supposed to move forward when you present something as an artist and go, hey, what do you think of this? Yeah. And yeah. instead of, oh, I don't know, man, is there any way we can change this? If all they are is just mad because they think I'm trying to be spiteful or something, yeah, yeah. there's just no way to move forward. And I've literally had that from, yeah. from high-end clients. So, I, I think we all have that. And I, different people have different reactions. They have different things going on in their life and different motivations. Of course, yeah. Of you course. know, and, and some people, at the, they're at the end of their life and, and their choices changes because of health or relatives yeah. or, or circumstances beyond yeah. everybody's control. Yeah. And it will take a, a, a product sideways, yeah. uh, you know. We've, so we've, we've had a couple of those here recently where we're like, oh, well, you know, a guy had some uh, some health issues and yeah. he just had to pull the plug on a project. Yeah. And then, you know, it's we bummer, understand. but it is, yeah. you know, it's just real. Can we see the inside a little bit? Uh, it's kind of in a various states of disarray, but. Okay. Well, but, we'll, we'll peek in the windows. That's yeah, good enough. It still needs to be assembled. <laughs> uh, there, there's some, so maybe we can come back and. Yeah. When it, you yeah. know, if you let me know when it's ready and take another peek at this one, you know. Well, hopefully a couple of weeks, but it would have to be soon. We got okay. to the car soon. So it's well, ready to be reassembled at this point. So. Okay. So we'll come back to this one, I promise. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, we'll have it all detailed up, and then, you can, then everybody can start picking apart whether, why the chips are wherever they are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, chips, but, uh, you know, the, the first, you really should put the first dent in yourself. Yeah, I hope not. Huh? <laughs> That's what I do with my car. After I paint it, I put a dent in it. Just kick it really I quick. really do. Just put it somewhere. Just yeah. so that there is a dent in it. You know. Perfect. I can drive it. Yeah. You can take the uh, uh, take the bad juju off of it right away. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Okay. If they want to know more about Max Fish and Bio Custom and Tim and everybody, where do they go? Uh, well, I've got multiple entities. Okay. So the book Give account, it all. The book account would be uh, the publishing company is Pedantic Publishing. Or air suspension design book will get you there as well. Um, yeah, and you'd have that on Facebook and Facebook Twitter. Facebook is and all air that. suspension design book. Instagram is Pedantic Publishing. Okay. Um, it's uh, yeah, kind of a weird thing, but regardless, okay. they're they're on either ones. My personal account, if you want to follow a little bit more of the silly crap I do on a day to day, is just the Max Fish on Instagram or Max Fish on Facebook. Um, the shop the fab shop is bio customs on instagram or on facebook but it's spelled k-u-s-t-u-m-z yeah. of course we got to screw that all up for everybody and make it or just like custom mics you know? yeah exactly. <laughs> missing an m uh, and then uh the products the for consulting and stuff like that would be f2 development on instagram or f2 collective on um on Facebook and I just recently for any of you guys that are super technical and want more and more information I just started a patreon account where it's a paid subscription but I post so much more technical stuff on ah. Patreon than I do anywhere else um, old features that I'll go you know stuff that I built again doing this for 20 plus years I've got yeah. a lot of stuff I can revisit and it's all gonna be in one spot so you can check out my patreon um, as well which I believe is under air suspension book Okay. Um, on Patreon, so it's a it's a unique thing. Not a lot of people are excited about leaving Facebook or Instagram, but uh, for me to create the type of content I want to create, I need a much more focused and condensed group of people uh -huh. to do the type of sharing that I want to do. So there's multiple tiers for uh, for the casual builder or for professional level shop owners and stuff. We can have different discussions. Um, it, within the app uh, is actually really, really nice. So, awesome. Uh, so yeah, might be a good place for you. Yeah, it might be. Yeah. <laughs> you never know. Yeah. All right. Have I forgotten anything or recovered? Uh, I think we're things? good. We've gone through yeah, pretty much everything. we haven't pointed out any of the terrible things. So. <laughs> well, I mean, we'd like to stay away from that, but that's why it's here to take care of the terrible <laughs> things, yeah. you know? So, yeah. all right. Well, I promise we will be back. I want to see this one uh, before delivery if I can. Yeah, absolutely. You know? We'll take it for a drive. Hey, thank you so much for having us down here. And I appreciate all you guys hanging at Custom Mics. Thank you. Until the next time. See ya. Yes.